Hello and welcome. Uh, for our final talk of the day, we have a really exciting speaker here. We have Sam Kitajima Kimbrell, and he is here to talk to us about scale, about what you can be doing with your time when you're not at Google scale, and all of the uh, cool things you can get done when you're not worrying about it. So let's have a big round of applause now for our speaker, Sam. OK, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Sounds like it. OK, hi. These are bower birds. They're these birds that live down in Australia, and they build these structures called bowers out of sticks and colorful objects that they find in their environment in an effort to attract mates. Uh, more on them later. Please, for now, enjoy the nice photos of birds that I found on Flickr. Speaking of Flickr, a guy named Cal Henderson used to work there. And in 2008 or so, uh, he said at DjangoCon US that uh, most websites are not in the top 100 websites. Turns out, if you do the math, all but 100 of them are not in the top 100 websites. So this is a Zipfian distribution. Uh, and it holds that the number of links, of traffic, uh, met users, whatever metric you want to pick for a website is roughly inversely proportional to its rank ordered by that metric among all sites. Uh, this graph happens to be Wikipedia articles and uh, hits. Uh, it looks like a straight line, but it's, uh, those axes are log log, so you know, we're looking at exponential decay there. And many empirical measurements and studies of the web have shown that this holds true. What I'm trying to say here is most of us, excepting people who might be in the audience from Google today, are not Google. And that's OK, because tons of products do just great at not Google scale. So I am also not Google. This is me. Uh, if you want to toot at me, uh, my handle is on the slides in the bottom left corner. I currently work at a company called Nuna, uh, where I build healthcare data analysis systems for Medicare. Uh, I previously worked at Twilio, and roughly a um, decade or so of experience on large and fast growing, but not Facebook scale web services. When I'm not doing stuff for Medicare at Nuna, I help run an event called North Bay Python, which will be returning to the historic Mystic Theater in Petaluma, California, just about an hour north of San Francisco this November. Please check us out online and hope, you should, hope to see you there. So back to Google. What do the giants in our industry worry about? Facebook, Amazon, Google, LinkedIn. They think about things like absurdly high throughput and storage requirements. Right? We're talking about petabytes of data, if not exabytes. We're talking about millions of requests per second globally, served by tens of thousands of servers in dozens to hundreds of data centers across the globe. And working and implementing those things using thousands of engineers and having an organization that's capable of structuring those engineers into extremely tiny niches and virtually limitless resources, right? billions of dollars, and the patience to take three months to train people on these systems when they hire them. So how does this manifest? I have a couple of case studies, uh, but before we get to those, I was supposed to click through all of these. Damn it, sorry. Um, right, case studies. First up, Uber. Um, night, a note here, uh, Uber has given us plenty of bad examples in non-technological things, and this is emphatically not an endorsement of any of their behavior towards human beings. But they did some stuff with databases that I thought was kind of interesting to talk about here. They were running into scaling issues with Postgres, and they blogged about this. And they blogged about how they built an entirely new datum store on top of MySQL with a whole bunch of abstraction layers on top of it. In those blog posts, they talked about what they were looking for. They wanted to, quote, linearly add capacity by adding more servers. And they wanted to do so in a way because they wanted to favor write availability, right? just get the thing on disk somewhere over read your write semantics, being able to go back and read the thing you just told the database about immediately. They also wanted event notifications, or triggers. Um, and I think they said, uh, quote, we had an asynchronous event system built on Kafka 0.7, and we couldn't get it to run in a lossless fashion, uh, end quote. Kafka ironed out all the bugs and got themselves to have a true lossless mode in 0.8. Have you tried upgrading? So what is schemaless? What is this thing that Uber built? It is an append-only, sparse, three-dimensional, persistent hash map very similar to Google's Bigtable. I have one reply to this. If you haven't seen this comic yet, I'll zoom in. The person on the left says, how do I query the database? It's not a database. It's a key-value store. OK, it's not a database. How do I query it? You're in a distributed MapReduce function in Erlang. And did you just tell me to go uh, f-star myself? I believe I did. 
point here is that this has a cost. When Uber did this and revamped their entire data storage system to use this, they paid some costs in the form of new abstractions. The boundary between the Uber application and their database layer changed. Their app now has to know and enforce all the schemas, because it's just a key value store, and all the persistence strategies, because you can't read your own rights. They went to eventual consistency, so you can't be guaranteed that that thing you just persisted is going to show up the next time you query for it half a second later, two seconds later. Neither can other processes. So you have to get a lot better at locking. They gave up flexibility in their queries. They said that you have to know your query patterns ahead of time. There's mandatory sharding in the system, so you can't do global reads without a lot of extra work. And forget about joins. And finally, Uber gave up on something that's really critical for small teams, which is developer familiarity. This is a completely custom system. Nobody knows it when they walk into Uber. They can't hire quickly on this thing. They can't ramp up those hires very quickly. And good luck finding contractor support. So that's Uber. Let's talk about Amazon. Um, about a decade ago now, I think, a guy named Steve Yegi quit Amazon and went to Google. And half a year, year after that, um, accidentally posted on his public Google Plus uh, this long rant about how Google was failing at developer platforms and Amazon Web Services was going to eat their lunch. The major focus was on how Amazon got their infamous service-oriented architecture. And how that happened, Steve says, is that in 2002 or so, Jeff Bezos, you know, king of Amazon, sent out an email and said, here are the following orders. All teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Teams must communicate with each other through these interfaces. There will be no other form of inter-process communication allowed. Da, da, da. The only communication allowed is via service interface calls over the network. It doesn't matter what technology they use. HTTP, CORBA, it was 2002. PubSub, custom protocols, it doesn't matter. But all service interfaces, without exception, must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. And to define externalizable here, we mean exposed to the outside world, i.e. to customers, and sold as a product. If you don't see it, this is the beginning of Amazon Web Services. And finally, because it's Jeff Bezos, anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. <laughs> so this is how Amazon decided they were going to make their developer organization and their systems scale as they grew really quickly. They were and continue to be extremely serious about this. But they learned some things, which Steve Yeggy was also kind enough to tell us. Amazon learned that pager escalation gets really hard because that ticket about a problem might go through 20 different service calls before we find the true cause. They found out that every single one of your peer teams suddenly becomes a potential denial of service attacker, that monitoring and QA are the same thing. They exist on this continuum of spectrum because sometimes the only thing still functioning in the server is a little component that knows how to say, I'm fine, Roger, Roger, over and out, in a cheery droid voice. And they learned that when you have all these services, you won't be able to find any of them without a service discovery mechanism, which requires a service registry, which is itself another service. So with both of the examples, what I'm trying to say here is that massively scalable infrastructure costs developer time. Because the mental model is so much more complicated. And when you aren't Google, you don't have a lot of that. So maybe some of you are saying, but I want to be Google. Surely I should build towards what I need to be in the future. And to that, I would like to say that Google wasn't Google overnight. Let's go back to uh, 1999. And Ben Gomez uh, did an interview um, a little bit after that. But he told uh, Reed Wright that when he joined Google, it took them about a month to index 50 million pages. That sounds really small today, doesn't it? And they only served about 10,000 queries per day. Google, as of 2006, was serving the same 10,000 queries every second. OK, I'm getting somewhere. That's seven years later, though. And in 2012, those same 50 million pages took them one minute to index. So that's 13 years of work. And sometimes Google still is not Google. I have it on good authority that many things internal to Google that don't require full Google web scale still run on vanilla MySQL. Really. Because even Google does not solve problems that they don't have. 
And all this goes to show that quote unquote boring technology can go really far. We learned last year um, at the keynote for this very conference that Instagram is still a Django monolith and they haven't even started using async IO. Horizontally sharded relational databases, which is a 15-year-old pattern. Uh, when I worked at Twilio, that was what we used to store all the text messages and calls we processed. Went 20,000 messages per second, and still gave the application full ACID durability and uh, consistency semantics, that nice thing we love called transactions. Another thing to think about is that exponential growth feels slow at first, right? If you and your product and your system are lucky enough to experience the joys of irrational exuberance and exponential growth, the lower part of the curve is gentle enough to give you some warning that this is coming. And more importantly, technology doesn't have magic thresholds built into it. There's no single point as you scale that curve that your entire system is going to go, oh gosh, I was just fine at 9,999 requests per second, but at 10,000, I can't possibly take this and fall over dead. So what you can do is instead, it will tell you, you'll find out where the thing that is the most on fire is, figure out how you will scale that and evolve it to your next order of magnitude of growth, replace it if you have to, and repeat. Okay, so hopefully you're coming along with me here and saying, okay, I'm not Google yet, but what should I do instead? What do I actually want to worry about if it's not scaling to 100,000 requests per second? I want to say that you need to maintain your users' trust and meet their needs. Because if your users don't trust you and they run away screaming because you ate their data, you're never going to get to your brilliant user. You want to be able to move fast without breaking things. Sorry, Zuck. Your team's time is one of the most precious resources. Make the most of it. And to do that, your team needs to be healthy. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about on-call and a little bit about inclusivity, inclusivity later, but there's a lot of other stuff that goes into it. Um, please do some more research and look for talks beyond this one. So let's be Bowerbirds. You don't have to reinvent every wheel as you scale, or even as you design a system at a fixed scale. You should build a Bower instead. So remember I said that Bowerbirds build structures from found materials in their environments to attract mates? Uh, let's say that, to stretch this analogy, the modern software ecosystem, everything out there, is our found environment. We want to have healthy relationships with our users and our team. So can we take what we need from our environment and combine it? And I'm going to talk about two things for the rest of this talk. I'm going to talk about how you make technical decisions with this model, and how to think about how to pick which pieces of technology you want to use, and then some stuff on how to run your team and how to get your business healthy and relate to your customers. So technology. We need a bottle cap. Uh, this could be a database, browser framework, web server. It doesn't really matter. It's a bottle cap. What do we want to think about when we're picking our bottle cap? We want to think about the maturity of the project we're considering. And right now I'm talking mostly about open source projects, but some of this applies to things you might buy from a vendor as well. Um, you probably don't want something that's brand spanking new, and you probably don't want something that's in the Apache attic, which is where software projects go to die. You also need to have maintainership. Um, ideally, maintainership on this project should not be the company that originally wrote it and open sourced it, uh, because that's how things get abandoned. Apache and related foundations are really the standard here if the project isn't just big enough to have a Django software foundation of its very own. You want to talk about security. You should search the databases of uh, exploits, CVEs, on the internet. Find out how many there are targeted at this thing. Uh, when they do come along, how fast are they resolved, if they're resolved at all? And when something does get patched, how hard is it going to be to deploy? Right? Are we talking about flipping a CDN link to update to a new version of jQuery? Or are we talking about rolling your database? Also stability. There's two types here. Uh, API stability. So is version 2.0 or version 0.9.1 going to come out and break all the things that you wrote against in the previous version? And is the system itself stable, right? Does your database database, or does it put everything in DevNull? You should think about the project's ecosystem. So this is. Uh, largely library support for your languages that you're developing in, and developer awareness and familiarity. Um, right back to Uber's example of schema -less. Once you pick a piece of technology and go with it, can you hire people quickly enough? And can they ramp up quickly enough? Are you going to be able to find consultants if you really find yourself in a pinch? If you pick tech that everybody knows, it means you don't have to wait three months for your new dev devs to be productive on your stack. 
And this is a really great thing like to talk uh, out of the boxiness. Um, hat tip to Josh Simmons here, who used it in a talk I saw a couple years ago from him. Uh, but the friction of using this thing for the first time. What are the first 30 minutes with it like? Um, you know, for example, are there Docker files so if you're using containers? Um, are there chef cookbooks if you're deploying to bare metal? Um, how easy is it to get going with? And documentation. Do the docs exist? Are they up to date? Are they comprehensive, searchable, discoverable? Docs are generally a pretty good thing to have. OK, uh, support and consultants. Can you get support contacts from somebody? Because when your Postgres database dies at 1 in the morning, and your backups for the last month turn out to be corrupt, you'll probably want some help. And finally, uh, licensing. Um, there are some surprises here. Uh, if you're writing for iOS and deploying to the App Store, you can't use GPL software. Or more recently, um, Apache Foundation declared that uh, the original model where Facebook would give you a license and a patent grant to use React uh, was no good. It was embedded in a couple of Apache projects, and Facebook ended up having to relicense React with MIT. OK, so that's mostly about open source. Let's talk about vendors for a few minutes. Open source and building a thing from scratch, obviously under only choices, we can pay money for other people to do things for us. So how do we decide if we want to pay a vendor to solve a problem for us instead of solving it ourselves? What would it cost to build the thing yourself? And how long would it take? There's two costs here, right? Uh, what would you lose in the meantime to not having it tomorrow? So fundamentally, what do your operations look like if you don't have a, a log aggregation platform? Uh, and also the opportunity cost to your feature roadmap in tasking two of your devs to go stand up a log aggregation platform yourself, and that's going to take a month. Uh, you have to choose something else that you're not going to build, because this is going in front of it. And finally, um, how hard is it to replace? What happens if, you set a, uh, if your vendor suffers from spontaneous, massive vendor existence failure? OK. So tech. It's fun, right? Let's talk about people. It's even more fun. Uh, how do we run our services, our projects, and our businesses? What should our relationships with our customers, um, as I said earlier, that we care about deeply and want to maintain their trust because we want to have a billion of them, what should those relationships look like? What does a healthy team that's serving those customers look like? So teams first. We're going to talk about a few things here. We're going to talk about on-call. We're going to talk about psychological safety a little bit. And then a related subject to that is inclusivity. On-call. All right. We have a problem as an industry with on-call and pager rotations. If you look at Industries, other industries where on-call exists, right, where 24 by 7 coverage is needed to keep something happy. Uh, hospitals, nuclear power plants, firefighters, they do this math. There's 168 hours in a work week. Oh, sorry, in, in a calendar week, there's 40 hours in the standard work week. That's 4.2 people. Oops, we can't have a fifth of a person. That's five people. Uh, if you do that math backwards, it only gives you 32 hours for PTO. In sick time, we probably need six people. So right, if you're in a hospital or something where safety of life is critical and you have a real 24 by 7 requirement, that true rotation with 40 hour shifts in a week is six people. We can't really afford to do that as software companies. I mean, I would love for everybody to do this, but um, software developers are expensive, and I don't, even, I wanna, I don't wanna know what six of me cost. Um, how can we make on-call be less awful when we know that we're not going to go do this? And what it means is we need to empower our on-call engineers and developers and give them the tools to work on automation. Right? This came out of DevOps, that employing humans to be robots is bad. So let's do less of it. Ideally, an on-call person's job should be to get paged at 2 AM uh, maybe once a week, ideally once a month. They should find the thing that broke and make it never do that again. You need to give whoever is on call the time and space to do this. That means not committing them to sprint points. You also need to think about the appropriate levels of availability and scalability. Right? Uh, as we saw earlier, Google did not go from 10,000 requests per day to 10,000 per second overnight, or even in half a decade. You need to have an obvious path to how you're going to scale by a factor of 10. And I like to think about like a line of sight to how you're going to get to a factor of 100 from where you are now. And on availability, you should think about how available and reliable your service actually needs to be. Right? Are you running telecom, where you probably have contacts with your customers saying you're going to have three and a half nines? Or are you writing like an appointment reminder system uh, for a doctor's office, where people are only going to be using it from 9 to 5 Monday to Friday? There are, uh, you can make trade-offs there. Math time again. 
99% uptime, two nines, right? Obviously, is three and a half days per year of downtime, or down to 14.4 minutes a day. These are all equivalent. Uh, three nines is 8.76 hours per year, or one and a half minutes per day. Four nines is less than an hour of downtime per year, or nine seconds every day. Mm, oh, we're in trouble here, because if it takes us three seconds to detect a fault condition, if we've really tuned our Nagios to ping everything every three seconds, well, the human is not going to respond in the next six seconds. Uh, so your mean time recovery is already gone if you have a human in the loop at all. And five, just for completeness, is five and a half minutes per year of downtime. So do you need that SLA? Don't overcommit yourself. Right? That office appointment app, if you do an offline database migration over the weekend when nobody's using it, nobody will notice. So don't sell things or don't commit yourself to things you don't have to do. Okay. So if we have a humane on-call schedule and some consciously chosen service level objectives and sensible alerting so we don't blow up people's pagers all the time, it gives us a culture where we can start to have people who might otherwise not join our team show up, people who have children, people who are disabled, um, which goes in hand, hand in hand with building a safe and inclusive work environment for those people. So psychological safety is a concept that came out of a Google study on how teams work. Um, I highly encourage you to go, at least go read a summary of it. It's a pretty long paper, but you should look up this concept. Um, but effectively, it means that we are most effective as teams working on a shared problem when everybody feels comfortable and safe, bringing their entire self to work and putting out solutions, potential solutions to problems without fear of being slapped down or rejected out of hand by somebody who thinks they know better. So that means we need to be inclusive, not just diverse. Right? Everybody has to be comfortable. Ways you can do that really quickly. Um, I'm going to set some ground rules. Right? Make a charter for your team. Things that might come up when you do this for a team of developers is code reviews. Right? Uh, how do people want to see code reviewed? How do they want to be addressed when people are going and giving them feedback? Uh, meeting etiquette. Right? Uh, don't interrupt people. Make sure that ideas, people who propose new ideas get the credit for them instead of being ignored and then having somebody else take it later. This happens. Uh, people need to have space to learn. Um, in particular, like, don't feign surprise. Right? If you're working with a junior dev and they tell you they don't actually know what SSL is, don't say, oh my god, I can't believe you've ever heard of SSL. Uh, be patient and teach them. And definitely don't tell people to RFT FM. That phrase needs to die. And you might also want to talk about how you're going to handle conflict between people in your teams. Okay. You need to be aware of and take steps to address conscious and unconscious bias in pretty much every process in your organization, hiring, promotion, et cetera. It's not just enough, and not, not enough just to hire women or people of color or queer, queer people or disabled people. You need to ensure that once they're actually working with you, they have equal access to growth opportunities, that they're getting new tasks and they're getting promoted just like everybody else is. And finally, please get professional assistance with all of this. There are a ton of consulting firms out there now that help with this. You should engage one and you should pay them because you shouldn't just make the few underrepresented minority people working at your company do this as an unpaid side gig when they want to do is write software. So in summary, make your on-call reasonable. Make your teams inclusive and safe for everybody working with you, because at the end of the day, we all work with humans first. OK. Users. How do we keep them happy? And this really also comes back to empathy. You need to know the people using your product. There are trade-offs as to how much data and how, how uh, high fidelity of a representation of your user base you want to capture. but. Um, and you can invest a lot of time or you can invest a little time, but make sure you have at least some idea of who the people using your thing are. Right? Um, are they on the latest and greatest MacBooks, or are they using uh, stuff from five years ago? Because uh, maybe they can't afford to upgrade all the time. Do they have an iPhone 5? Um, you need to know the impact on your users when you make changes or when you go down, especially when you go down, because it's going to happen. That means you have to set expectations, and using that empathy, Manage your users' expectations ahead of time. And uh, it never really fails to under-promise and over-deliver. You can also look into being able to degrade gracefully. right? Um, if you follow along with anything Netflix has talked about with their service architecture, uh, if the personalization engine at Netflix happens to be down when you open the app, there's a hard-coded list of recommendations built into the thing that responds at the front end so that 
they can serve you a page instead of a 500 error, and it might just not be a quite as good a list of movies for you. And you need to over-communicate and talk to your users. You should update your status page when you even think there might be a problem. And speaking of status pages, um, sorry, Amazon, I'm going to do this again. This happened last February when S3 went down. This also happened, quote, we were unable to update the individual services status on the AWS Service Health Dashboard because of a dependency that the Service Health Dashboard Administration Console has on Amazon S3. Oops. So put your status page somewhere that is completely independent of the infrastructure related to your actual product. If you're on Amazon, put it on Google Cloud. If you're on Google Cloud, put it on Azure, uh, and so on. Another really great example of over-communicating during failure was GitLab. Um, uh, 2016 now, I think. Um, they had a major incident with their primary database deployment. And what they did as they were troubleshooting that, they opened the Google Doc with their incident notes to the public and let their customers watch their engineers working in real time. Amazing levels of transparency. And it really helps to restore your customer's faith in you that you actually are working to fix the problem instead of just saying you're working to fix the problem. So yeah, over-communicate. Uh, another way that needs to happen is you need to staff up and get somebody in your support team watching your social media accounts, watching your Zendesk. And you need to listen to your support teams when they tell you that problems exist. You can also measure your support team's performance, right? Uh, uptime of our application isn't the only SLA we have. You can measure the time to first response on your support tickets. You can measure how long it takes to resolve them. You can ask your customers for a really quick satisfaction score, you know, one to five, when you close a ticket out for them, and so on. And pay attention to those metrics, too, because they give you a lot of important information about what your customers think and how you're doing with them. OK, finally, disaster recovery, because it will happen. Disaster recovery, you need to identify your fault domains, because more fault tolerance has costs. You need to think about how much it costs you to survive, and let's just pretend you're in Amazon, uh, a failure of a single host. Uh, this happens all the time. You probably need to be able to deal with it. Uh, the failure of a single availability zone within your deployment region. The failure of the entire region. The failure of all of Amazon. Think about the cost it takes to achieve resilience against each of those levels of failure and understand, just like you do with your SLAs and your uptime guarantees and your uh, and, uh, and scale, is how much you need. And practice. Exercise your failover mechanisms and backup recovery ahead of time, under controlled conditions, just do it, please. You'll thank me later. OK, security. Uh, you need to consider that as well. And I'm wrapping up here. Um, the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP, has immensely useful guides to just about everything in terms of securing web applications. Uh, I highly recommend you look at it if you're doing web applications. Um, know your threat model. And really what this comes down to is knowing what the valuable assets inside your system are that might be attractive to security attackers. Think about the vectors of attack by which they might try to access said assets. And then once you've got that all listed out, think about, go, th go through each one of those vectors and find a mitigation for it, and figure out when you can deploy that mitigation. Uh, quick tips, don't check your credentials into Git. I really have to say this because it still happens. And don't do this. Don't deploy a database and leave it listening on a public IP and port with no access control. This also happens. And just like with any other failure, treat security breaches the same way you treat all of your other incidents and communicate about them. Because the longer you keep it secret, the worse the backlash is going to be. We're still finding out things about what happened with the Equifax last year. Do you know your driver's license was in there too? Mm. OK, what was compromised? For how many people? How was it compromised? These are all things you have to tell your customers. And can it happen again? There's only one answer to that question is no. OK, uh, that's security, and I think that's just about it. That was a lot. I hope this advice helps you get more content and comfortable, no matter how big or small your system is. We may not all be Google or Facebook or Amazon, but we can all learn from their paths to the dizzying heights of scale and billions of users. And we can all adopt code and ideas from them and everybody else who came before us to build amazing new bowers of technology for our users. All right, last but not least, um, before I thought of the metaphor of bower birds, uh, the only thing I had going was dung beetles. So aren't you glad you got all the bird pictures instead? Thank you.